lots and lots of dirt and not much that we found. So it, we were camped out, it was boys, men and women, boys and girls out in the middle of the desert for a long time. And so I decided this was boring. A friend and I decided we we're gonna just go off on our own. We we're gonna hitchhike through Israel and see what we see. And, and this fellow was one year older. He was already in college and he knew about drugs. So he started talking to me about psychedelics. And I'd read a book in high school um, that was fantastic. And when a friend of mine gave it to me, he just said, you should read this book. And when I get back to him, I said, this is wonderful. And he said, you know, the author wrote some of that while he was under the influence of LSD. And I said, that can't be possible because LSD makes you really think not very smartly. And how could you do this? It was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey, who helped start the Grateful Dead and the acid tests. And so that started changing my mind. And then after the summer in Israel, I went to college and I was thinking at some point I'm gonna be arrested and go to jail, but I thought I might as well try LSD. <laughs> so I decided to try LSD and it was an eye opener. It was fantastic be in, in the way, it was very difficult. It was very hard, but I felt like I was finally getting in touch with my feelings. I was seeing more just beyond my narrow ego myself. And I thought there's a lot to this, but I wasn't so emotionally able to let the feelings go. And so I was very resistant and ended up um, having to go to the guidance counselor at my college. And the guidance counselor said, wow, this is legitimate what you're doing. There's a lot of people that are exploring LSD. There's LSD research. And here's a book that I suggest you read. And it was a book by Dr. Stanislav Grof called LSD, it was uh, Realms of the Human Unconscious, and it was about his LSD research in uh, Czech Republic and then also in Maryland. And it was incredible because he was a psychedelic psychotherapist, and he was looking, using science at spirituality, at the range of experiences that people can have with psychedelics, but he was putting it inside a very, he was a brilliant mind, brilliant psychiatrist, but also he was focusing on psychotherapy, on trying to help people feel better about their lives. And so that was like the practical test because a lot of times you can, I feel like you can get lost in spiritual literature and how does it really ground and help you lead a richer life or help you help others lead a richer life. So this was the reality test. And just as I was waking up to the value of psychedelics, there was a massive backlash against the hippies in the 1960s and against the scientists doing all the research with psychedelics. And it was all shut down. And President Nixon was saying, Timothy Leary, who was the advocate for LSD, was the most dangerous man in America. And I started thinking, why is he saying that? Maybe there's something important that Timothy Leary is trying to do that is threatening the system that's, that's going abroad to Vietnam and just making a big mess and killing all millions of people and so I decided that I would look even more at psychedelics and I decided since I couldn't have a legal career, uh, <laughs> so I identified myself as counterculture drug using criminal and I thought, okay, I'll be a psychedelic therapist. That's what my life goal is gonna, is gonna be. Is I'm gonna, you don't need a license to be an underground psychedelic therapist. So that would be my profession. So at age 18, I said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. And basically now I'm 62, and I'm so glad that the idea that I had when I was 18 still makes sense to me now. And <laughs> it's making sense more and more to the world too. So that there is a renaissance now of psychedelic research that's happening all over the world. More so now than at any time in the last 45 years. So if any of you are thinking one day, I wanna have a career doing research with psychedelics or being a psychedelic therapist or having a psychedelic clinic for psychotherapy, it's not a crazy idea. It's something that actually could happen. And so those people that are in school now are the first in 50 years that can think about a legal career in this area. And my life has been sort of this arc of trying to go from counterculture drug using criminal to a mainstream drug using legal person. <laughs> and I haven't quite got there yet. But we are seeing moves that are shifting in the United States with the whole idea of prohibition of illegal drugs. And what we find with medical marijuana is that 
as the medical use of marijuana, and we're seeing that here in Israel, that as the medical use of marijuana expands and people see that there are um, people saying, yes, this helped me and it didn't make me crazy, people start questioning, why is it illegal? And so support for legalization grows as medical use increases. And so now there's discussions in the Knesset about marijuana decriminalization. And it, it seems like from what we've heard, it probably isn't gonna work right now, but at least there's discussions. And last year I was here um, with Dr. Stan Groff, my mentor, and we um, were actually at the ashram further down and there was a, a rave there and we spoke there in the desert and got this idea that there is this whole culture in, in Israel growing as represented here by Burning Man, uh, by Midburn, and the science part is what's going to help really, I think, legitimize what's happening here in a way. And so starting in the 1990s, I realized that I'm not ready to move to Israel, that Israel needs friends abroad, but that maybe I could bring my work to Israel. Maybe I could bring psychedelic research to Israel. So we started in the mid 1990s and didn't get much reception. And then I learned that there was a doctor who was, uh, Dr. Moshe Kotler, who was head of psychiatry at Tel Aviv University. He was interested in Ibogaine, which is um, a route from Western Africa that's used for people with opiate addiction. And it helps people go through the withdrawal and have profound experience. And he was talking about possibly doing Ibogaine research here in Israel. And so I spoke to him and said, we'd like to do MDMA research here in Israel. And he said, well, you know, you have to educate us first and you have to also get permission from the Israeli Anti-Drug Authority. And at the time, they, they had the, uh, the Anti-Drug Authority was so backwards, they had a picture of a marijuana joint. Maybe you've seen this poster, but the smoke from the marijuana joint is curling up like a noose to hang somebody. So it's the idea of marijuana equals death. So we had to bring researchers from all over the world and we had a big international conference in 1999 on the Dead Sea. And then we had two more conferences in Tel Aviv over the years and eventually we were able to get permission for a study with MDMA for people, MDMA assisted psychotherapy with people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And this was at Bir Yaakov Mental Health Center, which is near Ramla, south of Tel Aviv. And it's run by the Ministry of Health it's for people with major mental illness, and they eventually gave us our own building. So we renovated a building, we have our own room, that's where we do psychedelic psychotherapy with MDMA there. And we've just finished, after all these years, a study with just 10 people, but we have very good results from these 10 people with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And what we're planning to do is to move to what's called phase three. So just to go back a little bit, I, I learned about MDMA in 1982 when it was still legal. And MDMA was used as an underground psychedelic therapy drug under the code name Adam, so that people wouldn't know exactly what it was and it wouldn't be so easy to make it illegal. But it was used by hundreds of psychiatrists and psychotherapists throughout the United States and some in Europe and elsewhere. And Unfortunately, some of the people that were using it in that therapy setting, some of the people said, aha, this is too important, too valuable, so many people would like it, I could make a lot of money, I'm gonna try to sell it in more public settings. And that's where MDMA became ecstasy. So once MDMA was both above ground as a party drug, but also underground as a therapy drug, it was obvious that there was gonna be a, a, now a backlash against MDMA. And so with a group of therapists, we prepared um, evidence and did secret studies about safety that we would then show to the government once they decided to crack down. 1984, the DEA tried to criminalize MDMA. And I went to Washington and filed with lawyers for a lawsuit. And we eventually won that lawsuit. And the judge said MDMA should stay as a medicine. But the Drug Enforcement Administration said, no way, we're not gonna listen. We're gonna make it illegal for all uses. And so we sued a couple times in the appeals courts, we won, but eventually the DEA said, okay, we're gonna make it illegal and there's no uh, objection. So in 1986, I started a nonprofit, an NGO called MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. 
and it's basically a non-profit pharmaceutical company funded by donations from thousands of people from all over the world. We recently received a $1 million donation from a fella in Sfat, Moshe Tov Krebs, for research in Israel. Yeah. And the, the reason that he made that donation, and this is sort of to get more into the spiritual aspect of it, is that when people are demonizing others, when they're scapegoating others, they're basically saying, they're different than me. They're somehow not as human as I am. They're somehow lesser than me. And then you can start discriminating against them. We saw that in America with slavery, with African Americans. It happens with Hitler and the sort of dehumanization of the Jews. It's that process of saying people are somehow, these people are different from me. And we also see that with nature, where we've been able to really do a lot of harm to nature, to the environment. Um, we see that with the way we treat animals that we eat very cruelly, that there's a lot of this dehumanization of others. But if we can have a mystical experience, and the essence of this mystical experience is the sense of connection, that we're all in it together, that that has political implications. And that those political implications are more in tolerance, in understanding, in reaching across different kind of lines. And I think that's what we really need, is how do we have, in a world where we see fundamentalists are rising all over the place, Orthodox Jewish fundamentalists, Muslim fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, very literalists, what is the antidote to that? And we see in the world, and, and in America we saw it a lot from the expedition to the moon, and the picture of the Earth from the moon, from the spaceship, that we're all in it together, the spaceship Earth. But to say that is one thing, but to feel it is another. And with psychedelics, you can have that sense of connection. And we know, Lior will talk just a tiny bit about neuroscience, how we're learning about what LSD and psilocybin does in the brain to reduce the activity in our egos, to, to let more information in. So the, the political idea is that integrating psychedelics into our culture, to the extent that we can do it, will help us be more accepting and tolerant and it will get us reducing all this hatred of people different than us so that's for me the most important thing about what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use medicine and science to help create legal contexts for psychedelic drugs and then people will lose some of the fears that they've had from the education and then little by little we'll be able to have places um, psychedelic clinics and also go into legalization and so we do a lot of work with ending prohibition so that places like Midburn that you can have more open and you know pure drugs people can have communal experiences if they want to and that's why I think a lot of what's going on at festivals all over Israel all over the world is people are trying to find those kinds of connections and psychedelics are often a big part of that.